Well, here I am at the uh, Myrtle Beach Atlantic Ocean side. Uh, Sunday morning here for another great edition of 153greatfish.com. It's our last study on the book of Ezekiel, but it's uh, just as important as all the other ones, so I hope you go back and uh, go over them. So, But what we need to do is we need to pray before we begin, so here we go. Well, here we go. <clears throat> Ezekiel's eyesight. That's our lesson today. This is number seven of seven, as I said. And uh, be sure you go back and go through one through six. This is, it's uh, a great primer uh, background for what you need to know. So let's go to our outline. Here we go. You'll see the four guys <laughs> looking up. This guy isn't looking. He's in, in a current state. This is a timeline for 29 AD to 33 AD. The church age, then of course the uh, millennium. So Ezekiel is a prophecy that has to be read with these four timelines in mind. The empty temple existed from 586 BC to 29 AD, no Kavod. We talk about that in a previous lesson. The age of peace, Israel had relative peace from the age uh, or from Zerubbabel to Jesus Christ. Uh, people that conquered it did not put it to the sword. The empty temple age, which is what we could call 586 to 29 AD, that empty temple age concludes with the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, where he is the kavod walking in flesh. He has the kavod inside of him. The kavod man, that's one way to talk about Jesus, the glory man. He properly interprets the Old Testament and is himself the king of Israel, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, he is, in fact, God in flesh. And then we see that the next age, 33 AD to present, the church age, is a spirit-filled temple. <clears throat> now, in each of these uh, time periods, God would have loved to have filled people with the Holy Ghost if they would have uh, come, come around to his way of thinking. Uh, the spirit-filled age, the church age, is an age of righteousness, peace, and joy, as it says in Romans 14, 17. Then the teacher of righteousness is manifest inside every person that receives the gift of the Holy Ghost. How do you know if you have the Holy Ghost? Acts 10, 46, Acts 19, 5 through 6, Acts 2 and 4. The Bible says that all shall be taught by God. You can read the Word of God, but without the Holy Ghost, you do not have the right interpretation. The Holy Ghost is the light so that you can eat the bread. A seminary just isn't going to do it. You can go to the highest high tower that you want to, and uh, it'll help, but at the same time, without the Holy Ghost, it's not going to do you much good. The church is then purified in the final three and a half years of the church age. So we see that Jesus' uh, last three and a half years was a purification of the empty temple, and then we see that in the church age, the final three and a half years of Revelation will be uh, the end of the church age. Then the third temple is built by Jesus, the Jews along with the Jews, as a memorial. It's a king's palace. It's a priest's uh, 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 palace as well. It's the inauguration and reconciliation festival. So we don't see the temple being rebuilt, a physical temple, until the millennium commences. That's our outline. So Ezekiel is a conditional prophecy with a multi-age timeline. You saw the four uh, bubbles that showed up. Uh, Israel and Judah prophecies are found in Ezekiel 3 through 23 plus chapter 34. The Instagram message that, that uh, Ezekiel receives is found in Ezekiel 24. God can send any of us an Instagram message at any time. The spirit trumps technology. Ammon, which is Jordan, Moab, Edom, which is called Mount Seir, and Philistia. These prophecies are also found in Ezekiel 25 and chapter 35. The Tyree prophecies... Uh, the rock of Lebanon, Tyrene means rock, are found in three chapters, Ezekiel 26, 27, 28. We're going to talk a little bit about this 28th chapter. The Egypt-Syrian prophecies are found in Ezekiel 29, 30, 31, 32. They're sort of blended together because God sees them as two bookends of a ruthless nation and uh, two, uh, two different ends, a sandwich like a vice, uh, Israel, and God is going to address them. Then the dry bones resurrection, both the church age and Israel's short work. Recall Paul talks about the short work in, in uh, Romans chapter 11, 
that when Israel comes into the Acts 2.38 faith. Gog Magog, which is a spiritual warfare of the church, and it's Israel's physical enemies that God is going to defeat. And we do need to know how to conduct spiritual warfare in the church. It's not what you think. Uh, we'll talk just briefly about that. The return of Jesus Christ, all Israel shall be saved, and the Armageddon victory, which is not the Gog Magog battle, but it is something distinct and unique in the end time. And then the third temple. This is a millennial teaching university, holiness government. Jesus is going to rule the planet. This is going to be his headquarters. It's going to be a teaching university. What did all these Old Testament things mean? And uh, why is there a temple in heaven? that is a mirror of the one on earth. And I think that's what we're going to see. Okay, the conditional prophecy. Remember, we're looking at always four time frames that the, this prophecy can apply. So if Israel fulfills their part of the covenant, this prophecy would not wait. Okay, these prophecies would not wait. If the church did the same, these prophecies would not wait. Can you say praise the Lord? So conditional prophecies... Uh, are kind of having an if-then-else format. If you do this, then God does this. Now, Israel-Judah prophecies condemn the social hierarchy. What is that hierarchy? The priesthood, the princes, or the royal house, the Sanhedrin leaders, the 70, the wealthy, and, of course, the poor, the widowed, and the socially disadvantaged. Now, it's the priest is the most important person in this hierarchy, along with the king. They are supposed to lead a nation into moral righteousness, to get close to God, and they failed. They all fell into idolatry, and then it ended up being the sin of eating and drinking blood, which was the sins of uh, Noah's day. So judgment on God's people falls due to a departure from holiness that's found in the covenant. If you look at the, the covenant in terms of uh, what's stated in, in Exodus and in Leviticus, and in the book of Joel, chapter 2, you will find a common word that's repeated over and over again, kadash in the Hebrew, holy. God's name is holy, and everything that God does is his, his internal nature of holiness, which we would define in the New Testament as agape love. God's holy nature uh, has to be maintained. If you maintain holiness, you maintain blessing. Many churches are stale and uh, are dead because they have not maintained holiness. They misunderstand coals of fire. Uh, this is the agape love that God has uh, granted to us in order to uh, help people come into the church. If you've got holiness, agape love in your church, you will have revival, and you won't be able to explain it. So what they did in, in uh, Israel was they defiled his holy name, his holy temple, his holy priesthood, his holy people, his holy land, holy living, the holy word. And, of course, if you work this backwards, it always ends up uh, profaning God's holy name. If you're a holy people, you must live holy because God is holy. Holiness is absorbed by close proximity to the Holy One. The kavod burns all the dross. So in other words, we gain holiness the closer we come to God. The further we are away from God, we end up in idolatry and immorality. God alone is holy. People cannot be holy. They simply must absorb holiness very much like the cherubim that are in God's throne chariot in Ezekiel chapter 1. They burn because they're close to God. That's why they're on fire. God is a consuming fire. So scripture, this is interesting, places God's word above his holy name. So, first the word, then the spirit. You need both. You can't just have the word alone or the spirit alone. You need both. The word and the spirit agree, it says in the New Testament in John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5. So God says, sends Ezekiel an Instagram message about Jerusalem's fall. I uh, see I spelled that wrong. He did that because there was no email, there was no telephone, there was no instant messaging. So God sends his own version of instant messaging to Ezekiel to let him know that Jerusalem had fallen. Okay. So Ezekiel 24, 1 through 2 says this, In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. This is what God said. Son of man, write down the name of this day, this very day. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. God commands Ezekiel to make note of this day. I don't know what Ezekiel called it. I called it the Instagram message. Okay, that's how I made note of it. And this is when the siege was, was uh, put to Jerusalem. So God notifies him at the beginning of the siege. 
And Ezekiel is also notified that his wife will die that very night. This is going to be quite a day, isn't it? Ezekiel is forbidden to mourn for his wife. We learned about that last time. God will not pity his people, his city, or temple. He will not mourn either. And that's why uh, Ezekiel is forbidden to mourn. Now, the Kavod left the temple, it says, on the sixth year, the sixth month, the fifth day. Now, that's, that's in chapter 10. So that tells me the siege of Jerusalem began three years, eight months, and five days after the Kavod, the glory of God, had left the temple, stood on the Mount of Olives, and then followed his people into Babylon. God <laughs> uh, did not have to stay in Jerusalem. Can you say, praise the Lord? Well, of course not. He was in the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, and uh, they carried God all over the place on their shoulders, the priests did. And uh, when you don't maintain holiness, you can lose the Holy Ghost. Isn't that interesting? Some people say, once saved, always saved. Uh, the Bible clearly teaches that if you do not live a holy life, you can lose the Holy Spirit. And when you lose the Holy Spirit, you are open to seven bad spirits that look for a swept temple. Can you say praise the Lord? So, judgments of four small nations occur. And this is going to occur throughout these timelines. Ammon, Moab, Edom, which is known as Idomea in the New Testament, and the Philistines, or Philistia, uh, we would call uh, this the Palestinians today. So Ammon gloats and rejoices, dances, and points the figure at Judah's fall. Ha, 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 is what they said. They laugh. Therefore, God turns them over to Babylon to be robbed and exploited. Moab? stated that Judah is like all other nations when they saw our fall without protection from their God, idol worshipers. That's what Moab accused them of. And, of course, they were really uh, uh, saying that your God is not really God. Therefore, God turned them over to Babylon to be absorbed, robbed, and no longer a nation. And there is no Moab nation today. Edom, okay, this was uh, Esau's uh, country. They participated in Jerusalem's destruction with Babylon. Therefore, God promises them an annihilation at the hands of a resurrected Israel. And uh, it's my belief that uh, this is yet to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, Esau, of course, is the father of Ishmael. And uh, we see that uh, this is going to happen in the end time. Read about it in Revelation 6, 1 through 8, the Battle of Armageddon. This is yet to occur. The Philistines participated also in the destruction of Judah out of ancient hatred. Why did they hate Israel? Because of Samson, Saul, and David's victories. So God promises that he personally will rebuke with wrath and exact vengeance on the Philistines. And uh, I'm not sure, but I believe this has not happened yet. This is uh, about to, to come in this final battle of uh, Armageddon. The Tyree prophecies. The reason I bring this up is that there's so many chapters devoted to the Tyree prophecies. Now, Here's some interesting stuff here. Tyre is the Phoenician word for rock, or the rock, which means an impenetrable island fortress and a landlocked city. So Tyre has two ports. It has landlocked port, and it has this little remote island just a few hundred yards offshore that is called the rock, okay, Tyre. Now, judgment is to fall on the landlocked city and the island fortress, okay? When did that happen? So Nebuchadnezzar besieged the landlocked city the same year he destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. However, he tried for 13 years to take down the island fortress of Tyre, and he failed. So he got the job half done. Alexander the Great then succeeded in taking down the island fortress in 332 BC. He took seven months to build a causeway road 200 feet wide out to the island. He put a siege engine on top of it, and that's how he took down the island fortress of Tyre. Now, Ezekiel writes a lament, which is a funeral dirge for Tyre, much like Lamentations is a funeral dirge. That's simply a funeral poem. God pronounces a personal judgment on the prince of Tyre, a man who said, I am God. You find that in Ezekiel 28, 9. But there's something very interesting here in Ezekiel 28. He pronounces a personal judgment on Satan, the king of Tyre, in an unusual glimpse into Satan's angelic creation, role, and fall. You can read about that in Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. If you want to read why God is going to judge Satan, here it is, right here. You can find out what happened in heaven. It's all there. 
Tyre and Zidon, which is Lebanon, they bought Jewish slaves after Jerusalem's fall. That was their great sin, why God was going to take them down. And uh, just keep in mind, uh, God began it in 586 B.C., and he finished it in 332 B.C., and still he's got some things to do here when he casts Satan into the lake of fire uh, at the end of the millennium. Here you'll see uh, a picture of Tyre. Here's a aerial photograph of it. Here you can see this is the landlocked city of Tyre, and here is the island, uh, Rock Island, which this used to be all water in between here. Okay, until, uh, what's his name there, Alexander the Great built the causeway, and now, of course, there has been a bunch of uh, uh, sea crustaceans that have collected, and this now has become part of a permanent isthmus. Anyway, that's the way it looks today. Here you can see the way it used to look, the Siege of Tyre, 322 B.C. by Alexander the Great. Here's this island nation, and the Prince of Tyre said, you know, I am a god. I cannot be taken down. I can't be defeated. There was a lot of trading uh, going on here. It was a seaport, a lot of vessels, and it was a, it was a major seaport uh, between Europe and Asia and Africa, where if you wanted to trade some uh, wheat for some barley, this would be the place, one of the places you would do it. Here's the landlocked city of, of Tyre, and which was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So you can see that this jetty of the uh, Zidonian Harbor, <laughs> this is the way it looks like, and... Uh, Anyway, there's 5,500 people there. Uh, during Alexander's siege, the number of inhabitants uh, almost doubled, rising to 45,000 people. I don't know how they all crammed in here, but uh, you may want to stop the video uh, on the archive and, and read more of the uh, stuff that's uh, on this one. Tyre means the rock. It was a powerful commercial city in the midst of the sea. So Egypt's prophecies. There's the four periods that we're looking for, for the uh, co conditional prophecy of, of Ezekiel. Now, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and the country of Egypt were to be captured and put to the sword by Nebuchadnezzar. And, of course, Ezekiel prophesies this. And then God pronounces a personal judgment on Pharaoh, which appears to be a pseudonym for some sort of rebellious cherub being much like Satan was the anointed cherub that covered. And uh, it looks like God is doing uh, some sort of a double and tendre here with this. Egypt's judgments span four chapters of Ezekiel, 29 through 32. Uh, God's pretty upset with these people. It looks like there's some uh, old things that are going on here. God never wants Israel to depend on them again. God mixes Egypt's judges, judgments with serious judgments. He sees it in the same way. Two of the most ruthless nations, they deserve jaw hooks because they were centers of slavery. Okay, That's why God's going to take them down. The Gog Magog nations are named in the Egypt Syria judgments uh, in these uh, uh, four chapters here, not just in uh, Gog Magog prophecy that we're going to read about later here. Dry Bones Resurrection. So Ezekiel 33 is oftentimes called the second call of Ezekiel. He's called a watchman, and after this second call on him, he's going to have words of consolation after the words of warning. Now he's told that if he doesn't warn people, then his blood would be required. The judgments will fall on him. But if he warns what God gives him, then of course he has a promise. He's going to get words of consolation, and he did. Words of comfort, words of promise. This is what God says to Ezekiel. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys. Remember we said what those were in a previous lesson. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealous wrath, because you have suffered the reproach of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I swear that the nations that are all around, you shall themselves suffer reproach. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. Now, we could look at those four time periods and say, when did they come home? And uh, it seems to me that all uh, four of those periods uh, have some meaning here and some reflection in this uh, conditional prophecy. So God explains to Ezekiel and his people why he deported and punished them. Let's read about it here. Ezekiel 36, 17 begins, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman and her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land for the idols that, with which they had defiled it. 
recall Israel in order to please Egypt and to please, or to please Babylon would import their idols into their own culture, their own, their own city, their own temple, and they'd set up the image of jealousy. And then, of course, this, uh, this idea of sin of, of blood, uh, blood being shed, they had uh, degenerated into just absolute materialism and immorality, and the poor and the social justice issues were not addressed at all. And so God gives Ezekiel, here's why I did it. Now, God also promises his kavod to return to Israel, producing a new holiness nation. Now, we know the kavod never returned to Zerubbabel's temple, uh, 520 B.C. to uh, 29 A.D. And we know that, uh, so God's promise of the kavod to return didn't happen until Acts 2 and 4, 33 A.D. But let's just read about it. Ezekiel 36, 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle you clean with, with clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, the Holy Ghost produces a holy people, a treasure, a peculiar and separated, sanctified people. So what is it about God's name being profaned? I'm just going to tell you straight up. The name of God is Jesus. How come people aren't getting baptized in the name of Jesus? Why are they profaning it? praying to titles like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You need to know who your Father is. Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do you say? Show us the Father. People are profaning his name because of a lack of holiness. If you want to get the revelation of Jesus' name and that you need to take it in the waters of baptism, holiness is required. Holiness is simply drawing close to God and then he will draw close to you. You know, Jesus works on the inside of the cup first before it gets to the outside. And so we have to understand that both happen when you draw close to God. The holy name cannot be profaned. I wonder, how would people cast out a devil? In the titles, I cast you out, by the titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The devil's going to laugh. How about praying for your food in the titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost? You know, it just seems to me that why aren't people getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? That is how you dedicate the temple, the new kavod. The kavod, you can receive the Holy Ghost before you get baptized. A lot of times it happens afterwards. Regardless, the temple must be dedicated, and the name of God must be put on the temple. At least it was in Solomon's day. In the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel's asked a question. Can these bones live? The dry bones are Israel, or it's a dead, unproductive church body. These bones are dead. They can't live. And, of course, Ezekiel says, you know God. And God gives him the, the knee bones connected to the shin bone, connected to the ankle bone, connected to the wrist bone, and on and on he goes. And this is what God says in Ezekiel 37, 24. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers live. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies or cleanses, makes holy Israel when my sanctuary is in the midst forevermore. Well, we know that Paul tells us in Revelation 11 that all Israel shall be saved. They will come into the church. How will they come in? Their dry bones will be resurrected by the infilling of the Holy Ghost. They'll get the Acts 2 and 4, the Acts 10, 46, the Acts 19, 5 through 6 experience, and then they'll have a shepherd over them on the inside. The head of every man is Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12. Do we need a pastor? Absolutely, we need a pastor. He's an under-shepherd. However, he needs to rule correctly, as Ezekiel 34 says. 
and he needs accountability, but he also needs people to pray for him. Have you prayed for your pastor today? Are you going to church today to fellowship with the saints? How can you take communion without being part of a church body? Listen, the Holy Ghost is what produces live bones. And flesh then appeared on the bones, and Israel will be restored, and a church, a dead church, can be restored as well. Can you say praise the Lord? Finally, I'm going to talk about Gog, Magog, and the Third Temple. Um, Gog, Magog seems to be the spiritual enemies of the church and of Israel. Uh, it's a spiritual warfare. Israel's physical enemies, possibly. Compare this with Psalm 83, Joel 2, and Revelation 20. It seems to me that this is a spiritual war of some sort. Why is it that all nations come against Israel? They have the most foolish votes in the United Nations. What spirit is motivating all those people to hate Israel? The, uh, the Germans uh, committed the Holocaust, and they still vote against Israel by abstaining in the United Nations. Something spiritual is going on here. And I believe that Gog Magog is spiritual warfare of both the church, and it could be Israel physical enemies. I haven't, I haven't made up my mind about that. It's kind of a wait-and-see deal here. But look at Revelation 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years of the millennium are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He's in prison for a thousand years where he can't speak. He will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the church, the beloved city, Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven like Elijah's fire and consumed them. That looks like a spiritual battle to me. I don't know what you think, but uh, you have your own ideas. Why don't you comment on this uh, uh, YouTube today and... Uh, Send me an email. I'd love to hear what you think. Okay, so the return of, Israel, of Jesus Christ occurs. All Israel is saved. The Armageddon victory. And then the third temple, which is a millennium, my belief, it's a, it's a millennial teaching university, holiness government. That's found in Ezekiel 40 through 48. And uh, that concludes our study of the book of Ezekiel. All I wanted to say is uh, there are seven <laughs> lessons if you go through this, I'm hoping that you'll begin uh, taking the opportunity to read the book of Ezekiel. And uh, we've looked at many structures. We've, we've discussed a lot of different ideas. Um, let's just uh, say praise the Lord. And uh, I'm not saying that everything I said is accurate, uh, but it's kind of the way I look at it. So take that for what it is and uh, come up with your own conclusions, as always. Okay, we'll see you next time here on another edition of 153greatfish.com.